Good evening. First of all, um, a few news notes. We've had a very large sunspot. It's gone now, it's disappeared over the sun's edge, but it did produce a brilliant display of Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. And that picture was taken by Terry Mosley from Belfast. Certainly the best aurora we've had for a very long time. There are three bright planets in the evening sky now. You can't mistake Venus in the west after sunset. It's so brilliant, it looks almost like a small lamp. We also have Jupiter in Cancer the Crab, near the star cluster Praesepe, and we also have Mars above Orion. And certainly Mars has faded very considerably now, but we have got one absolutely stunning picture of it, and that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And certainly it shows much more than any ground-based photograph has ever done. So although the Hubble mirror is not perfect, we know that, it's certainly quite wrong to write the telescope off as a failure, as some people have done. It is doing very good work indeed. And now, on to our main theme. Over the last 34 years of the sky at night, we've studied almost all the wavelengths of radiation. Not only visible light, but also the long radiation radio waves, collected by instruments such as the George Royal Bank Telescope, the Lovell Telescope, and right down to the X-rays, which have to be studied by satellites such as ROSAT. And uh, ROSAT's given a certain amount of trouble lately, but it does seem to be working well again now. But one aspect we've never tackled is that of cosmic radiation. And this is a very good time to do it, because we have a very special guest, Professor Arnold Wolfendale, Durham University, who is, of course, our new Astronomer Royal. And certainly the only Astronomer Royal to have made his name by studying cosmic rays, which are not really rays at all. Welcome to the sky at night, Arnold. First of all, um, they're not rays, they're particles. So isn't it rather a curious name? Well, it is rather. And uh, to explain it, I should go back to the history of the discovery of this phenomenon. Um, the point is that at the beginning of the century, a lot of uh, workers, uh, particularly physicists interested in radiation, were very puzzled by the fact that their instruments could not be shielded mm. completely. Mm. They could never get a zero reading. Yeah. And uh, by 1912, the problem was really severe. Mm. And in that year, Victor Hess took one of the instruments, the best he could lay his hands on, and went up in a balloon, and it was he who made this great discovery. And here's my hero, Victor Hess, there wearing a peak cap in the middle after his perilous ascent. I think this is a fascinating photograph, don't you? I do indeed. It looks highly dangerous to me. Well, that's the people surrounding him look highly <laughs> dangerous as well. <laughs> Particularly the uh, man with the moustache. But uh, let's move on. Um, Hess found that uh, as he went up in height, the reading on his instrument uh, went initially, went down, as you can see from this graph here. Mm. This shows a radiation yes. level as a function of height in kilometers. And then it started to increase and went up and up. And he got to a height of 17,000 feet. <laughs> Unbelievable height, a hydrogen-filled balloon, no oxygen <laughs> for the participants or anything of this sort. He would, he, would, he would like it to survive, I should think. Well, that's absolutely right. It was a wonder he got the right answer, wasn't it? It was. But he said, right, this increased level is due to a radiation coming in from outside. Now, at that time, the only intense radiation that was known was gamma radiation. So he called it the cosmic radiation, and it was thought they were gamma rays. Mm -hmm. But when did he realize it wasn't where well, they weren't actually rays at all? Well, other work followed this, and it was shown that instead it was particles that were responsible. Well, if they're particles, what kinds of particles are they? Pretty well all the atomic particles you can think of, and no doubt a few that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, the simplest, uh, the hydrogen nucleus, is present in abundance there, the protons, and then alpha particles, the helium nuclei, the electrons, uh, are present to the extent of about 3%, heavier nuclei, and then an enormous number of neutrinos. But these neutrinos do very little, very, very hard to detect, and we can put them on one side for the moment. Well, why is it so important to study these cosmic rays? In the early stages, in the early days, certainly in 20s, 30s, 40s, and even the early 50s, they were the only source of energe really energetic particles. So the nuclear physicist was very keen to see what happened when these cosmic ray particles struck the matter in his cloud chamber or bubble, uh, well not bubble chamber, in his cloud chamber or whatever detector he had. And here we have a photograph of, of a cloud chamber showing 
uh, a particle, a cosmic ray coming in from near the center at the top, traveling downwards, and the horizontal bands are lead plates in the cloud chamber. Mm -hmm. And you can see the particle goes into a plate and smashes a nucleus to bits, and the various constituent parts cascade down, mm -hmm. multiplying as they go and then diminishing in number. And this same sort of phenomenon happens in our own atmosphere. Cosmic ray comes in at the top and produces a cascade of particles. Now, some of these particles, the so-called uh, muons, arrive at ground level, as indeed do some of the others too. But to give you some idea of how many of these cosmic rays there are, there are about five of these muons passing through our heads every second, and people with big heads have rather more. <laughs> now, we have traced the particles underground. In the early experiments, and indeed some were done before our own, before the war, were carried out in, in a, a very useful system of underground laboratories uh, in London. <laughs> and here we have four of the laboratories that we used in the 40s and, and 50s, Waterloo, Arsenal, Hoban, and Hampstead. And we studied the properties of these mu mesons, or muons as they're called, as they pass through apparatus in those, simple apparatus in those locations. I rather imagine they're less crowded than they are now. Well, that's right. <laughs> and then we continued in, and indeed traced the particles all the way down in the very deep gold mines of uh, southern India. Here's a, a mine near Bangalore, Urgaon near Bangalore, depth of 7,600 feet, and a tiny fraction of these muons of tremendous energy are able to penetrate to these depths. Well, cosmic rays have been known now for 80 years, but I gather that their locations are still very uncertain. They are, and in a sense, that's the sort of thing that keeps me in business. <laughs> and you might say, well, why uh, are they so difficult to, to, to find? Why is it so hard to find out where they're coming from? I mean, we can see starlight coming from stars. Mm. Why can we not see cosmic rays coming from cosmic sources? And the problem is that uh, there's quite a strong magnetic field, very tangled magnetic field in our galaxy. And the cosmic rays, say the protons, the most common particles, carry a positive charge, and they wander around in and out of the, the stars in their galaxy from their sources. And this means that if you see a cosmic ray coming from some particular direction in space, you can be quite sure that it hasn't come from <laughs> some object that you can see if you look along the direction where it arrives. Now, we can look at this in a, an animated fashion with respect to a photograph of another galaxy. It's not possible, of course, to have a, regrettably, to have a photograph of our own galaxy. But if we look at uh, a photograph of another galaxy and imagine that this is our galaxy, then here we have, uh, in fact, it's M51, one of your favorite galaxies, I know. The Whirlpool. The Whirlpool galaxy, that's right which is masquerading as our galaxy for the purpose of this argument. We put the sun on somewhere near the outside, and if we take a cosmic ray produced somewhere in the inner part of the galaxy, it meanders around. In fact, it's traveling very rapidly, but of course the scale has been reduced enormously. And after some tens of millions of years, it usually escapes from our galaxy. But very occasionally, one will actually arrive at the Earth, occasionally on, on that scale. And these are the cosmic rays that we see. Well, how do you tell where they come from, then? This is where gamma ray astronomy seems to be coming to our rescue. And that means using space research methods and satellites. Yes. The gamma rays of the energies in question are not able to penetrate through the atmosphere because of its thickness. And one, it must use space vehicles. And uh, a famous European uh, satellite was COSB, mm -hmm. of which we have a, a picture here. And one can see various numbers on this uh, photograph. Number two is the uh, important part. Well, they're all important, but is the essential part. The uh, spark chamber inside number two there is uh, quite a big volume full of gas with metal plates. And a gamma ray goes in, and is its energy is converted into an electrical signal, and that is recorded at the ground. And that went up in the, in the 70s for a number of years and the analysis has been uh, completed. And we're now awaiting, uh, during the next week or two, hopefully, the flight of the, gamma, the American, or the NASA, Gamma Ray Observatory, of which we have an artist's impression here. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that this uh, improved version 
of uh, a gamma ray observatory will deliver the goods. Now, what happens uh, in this field is that the cosmic rays penetrate the gas in the interstellar medium. Here's a photograph of one of these dense clouds of dust, one of your favorites, the North America Nebula. Uh, the dark area on the right-hand side is due to dust. There's this vast cloud of dust, and in this dust, behind this dust, within the dust, one finds a lot of molecules and atoms of gas. And the cosmic rays knock into these atoms, knock into the nuclei, and by various processes produce gamma rays. And the gamma rays then travel in straight lines. So this means that the gamma rays are providing information, as it were, by proxy of the distribution of the cosmic ray particles. And if we look at the, the data, we get a clue as to what sort of mechanism is responsible for accelerating the cosmic rays. And it, I'm almost certain, one can never be completely certain in this game, but I'm almost certain that supernova remnants are responsible. And we can look at one of the famous remnants, again, another of your favorites. Uh, this is the Vela supernova remnant here on the screen. And we see these beautiful wisps of gas. And these are shock due to shocks. A very great amount of energy was liberated initially, which is pushing the, the gas around, some of it is ionized, as we say, and in this way, in these shocks, cosmic ray particles are being accelerated. Now, that is a restricted region of space. If we take all the, the cosmic ray, sorry, the cosmic gamma ray data, and take all our knowledge about gas, we can try and look at the distribution of cosmic rays on a grand scale. So, if we go back now to look at the picture of the, of the galaxy, here we, uh, we have it. Our pseudo-galaxy, uh, the Sun, as you can see, is about two-thirds of the, of the way out. And uh, if we look in the gamma ray sky, as I say, look at the distribution of gas, we get a picture for the cosmic ray particle distribution. And here in this uh, picture, we have an estimate of what it looks like. So that if we were able to move from our present position near the sun towards the center of the galaxy. As we know, it's not to be recommended. No. But if we were to do that, able to do that, I think we would find that the low energy cosmic ray intensity would increase, go through a maximum, fall down again, and increase out again towards the center of the galaxy. And this, I think, would mirror the distribution of the supernova remnants. But this well, is all for low energy cosmic rays. Well, what about the higher energy cosmic rays, and um, how high can you go? Well, one has been able to, to get as far as 10 to the power 20 electron volts. Now, this is the highest energy known to, to mankind, far higher than any energy that can be achieved with accelerators. And we can look at the energy spectrum, the number, the intensity on the left-hand side of the scale as a function of the energy. And one sees on the left there that each interval, the distance between the horizontal marks, is a factor of 10 to the power 4, 10,000. So you can see that when you get to the highest energies, the number is very small. If we start at the top left there, the low, at the lowest energy, we have roughly a half a particle per square centimeter per second. And these are the particles, very low energy, most of the particles are there. These are the ones, that, the primaries, that produce the secondaries at ground level, where, as I said earlier, there are about five passing through our heads every second. Then as we increase in energy, we go through another region where the number is perhaps uh, one a minute per square hundred meters. And then finally, at the top end, we've got, what is it, 0.3 per square kilometer per decade, for the units I know, but very, very rare. Well, how do you go about detecting these? I mean, after all, you can't, you can't go and build a detector with several square miles in area. Yes, it's a great pity that we <laughs> can't do that, but you're absolutely right. Well, this is where the atmosphere comes to our rescue. Because if we think about what happens, we remember the earlier photograph, cloud chamber photograph, that showed a cascade developing in the cloud chamber. Same sort of thing happens in the atmosphere on a much, much bigger scale. And we have a rather nice animation, this shows a particle coming in, producing secondaries, which multiply and multiply. And finally, in the real world, at the ground level, if you had a particle of 10 to the power of 20 electron volts coming in at the top, the highest energy known to man, 
there'll be 10 billion particles coming down almost simultaneously and hitting the Earth at once. And they're distributed over a square kilometer or so. So if you have a number of detectors, only a smallish number distributed over this area, then we can get a, a signal. And at Havre Park, uh, near Harrogate in Yorkshire, there is one such array. Here you see one or two of the huts. There are others on the skyline containing detectors which respond to these big cosmic ray showers. And what we have been doing in Durham recently has been taking the data from all the world's detectors, and there's some really big, big ones uh, in various parts of the world, in the Soviet Union, America, an old one in fact in America, uh, Japan, and Australia, and putting the data together, together with that from Havre Park, analyzing it very carefully, and we hope correctly, and we seem to have found the directions at any rate of some of these extremely high energy particles. Now, the point is that the magnetic field in our galaxy isn't strong enough to bend the trajectories, or shouldn't be, at these high energies, so we have a much better chance of beaming back to where they're coming from. And the, the uh, picture that we're seeing now shows, uh, this is the so-called uh, Lund picture of the, of the galaxy. There's the Milky Way stretching across. It's a sort of map. And our cosmic ray sources are represented by dots on this picture here. And what excites us, well, apart from the fact that there are dots at all, is that, that some of them align with the galactic plane. You see four on the left and two on the right, very close to the Milky Way. And it looks as though, at any rate, some of the cosmic ray sources are in our galaxy and they're in the plane. What exactly are they? Well, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that question because the answer is still not forthcoming. We're working very, very hard to try and find out what they are, but we don't know. However, at the highest latitude, that is, well away from the galactic plane, there are some enigmatic sources. And there's one there, the top dot on the picture, which uh, unbelievably almost lies in the direction of the Virgo cluster of galaxies, the center of our supercluster. And here's a, an optical photograph of it showing galaxies rushing around. And what we think may be happening, not absolutely sure, but we think may be happening, is that those galaxies are producing shock waves in the intergalactic medium, similar to the shock waves we saw from the Vela supernova remnant in our own galaxy. And those great shocks are accelerating the cosmic rays. Arnold, thank you very much. It's all quite fascinating. And uh, before we go, may we all wish you very many happy years as Astronomer Royal. Thank you. And uh, before I go to, remember, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamped letter envelope to Newsletter 41, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127RJ. Or, of course, look at CFAX, page 616. And don't forget our Sky at Night information line. You can phone 0836 406075, 34 pence per minute cheat rate and 45 pence per minute at other times. And so, until next month, from the Astronomer Royal and myself, good night. <laughs>